Hi, um, this is a quick video about um, another method of using DMA on microcontrollers to implement unusual peripheral functions. This is a quick lash wrap prototype for um, part of a system which will be driving some lead strips based on the um, Texas TLC5971 driver chip. This uses an SPI type protocol very similar to the APA102 dot star type devices which takes a um, serial clock and data and then uses the gap in the clock to latch that data. Um, so, so this technique is applicable to you know, the various different, different drivers that use this technique. Um, this is using a PIC32, but the, the general technique should be applicable to pretty much any micro that's um, got DMA. Now, for mechanical reasons, this needs to drive six, feed six sets of strips. I've got three of these strips side by side on the bench, but that'll actually be one long strip. Um, my bench isn't long enough to have them uh, running as a single line. So each of these is basically going to be driving six of these um, sets of strips. So, so basically all I need is six SPI ports. Now, uh, one way I could have done this was the method I used on the, um, the splitters for the installation I described in the um, starting a truck with a draw battery video where I sort of effectively externally multiplexed the two existing ports in turn so you send out the data on each port you know, one at a time and, and switch it externally with the gates. Now a couple of reasons I didn't really want to do this firstly um, this, is, uh, this has got six ports and I wanted to keep the SPI clock frequency as low as possible just to sort of minimize the, any sort of potential um, sort of signal integrity issues and um, but also sort of, yeah the, I wanted the SPI clock to basically be dictated by the overall system frame rate so I wanted to keep it low and that, that turned out to be around 500 kilohertz is, is the sort of figure I was, I was aiming at. Now I've used a sort of similar general architecture of like high speed serial into multiple low speed serial outputs and number installations with UART type data so we've got a variety of different splitters from various um, other projects and installations um, these typically output data around the 100k board sort of figure so this one for example this outputs 12 um, sets of data at, at, I think it's 125k board and in fact I've recently done one this is actually using the PIC32NZ um, this actually outputs 72 ports of uh, 100k board data from Ethernet, but say so that's also using about a 200 megahertz processor, so that's sort of got quite a lot more um, grunt. The normal approach I've used uh, for this type of splitter is to have a timer interrupt running at the output board rate, and then sort of software bit juggling basically to output though all the data for the data for each port on each timer interrupt. So, for example, for a 100k board, you'd have a timer interrupt every 100 microseconds. Um, and in fact, what I tend to do is actually do the serial because this, these things are doing nothing else other than just literally taking the data in and squ squirting it out again. The incoming serial data, typically between two and four megaboard, has generally just been done as a foreground task, polling the, um, the UART. And because the UART's got an 8x5 FIFO, you can actually do that quite happily because um, the outgoing data rate is the most important thing to keep, keep in time. So I just wanted to have a single interrupt going. Now, one issue you run into once you start wanting to increase, say going from the sort of hundred odd k board up to five hundred k, is particularly on the the low end PIC thirty twos because they don't have um, interrupt dedicated interrupt shadow registers. The amount of time it takes to get into and out of the interrupt becomes quite significant. Um, I'm going to illustrate this. In this example, we're, this is receiving data at four mega board uh, with an interrupt driven um, serial receive routine. The blue trace is basically going high as soon as it gets into my interrupt routine and low as soon as it goes out. And the green trace is just a foreground task that's simply toggling a pin. So we can see that um, we've got eight bytes come in, we get the interrupt when the FIFO is sort of nearly full and then during our interrupt routine we empty, the, empty, um, empty out the FIFO. But you can see that the actual gap in time, this is uh, five microseconds per division. So you can see the time between the foreground task stopping and my task starting, that's about sort of 1.3 microseconds and we've got about the same at the end. Which means that if we're trying to generate um, output data, say at, at, for example 500 kilohertz, then that's just not going to work because all our time is going to be spent getting into, into and out of the interrupt routine. So that approach of outputting one, you know, one bit per interrupt just isn't really going to work as soon as we get above about 100 odd kil kilohertz. So it's, it's less of an issue on some of the higher end PIC32s because they have shadow interrupt registers instead of having to save all the um, context on the stack they can just do a bank swap. I've not really played around extensively with those to um, see how much difference that makes. But um, So for this I sort of decided to sort of take a different approach. So um, the way I'm actually doing this, implementing these SPI ports, is by using DMA. Now just a quick recap. DMA is a fairly simple system whereby any 
any event which could normally cause an interrupt. You can also generally cause it to trigger the DMA control, which simply initiates a transfer from one memory location to another memory location. So typically this would be from a peripheral device to a buffer in memory or a buffer in memory to a peripheral device. And certainly in the PIC32, and I think you know, fairly commonly on most microcontrollers, they're very sort of flexible in that pretty much any interrupt can cause, cause this to happen. And then from that interrupt, you can tell it, for example, how many bytes to transfer each time and how many bytes to stop, you know, for example, take X amount of interrupts and then um, stop transferring after that. And generally also generate an interrupt when it's finished. So for example, if you're maybe outputting a burst of data to a serial port, you could tell it to say, okay, copy from this buffer. So you give it the, the address of that buffer in memory. You Give it, then give it the address of the data register of the serial port and then set up the DMA control to say, OK, stop after, I don't know, 64 bytes or whatever. And say, uh, if necessary, you can get it to generate an interrupt after it's done that transfer. And the, the advantage of this is that the processor itself isn't involved. DMA controller takes control of the memory bus, does those transfers, so you don't have any of this um, context save overhead. You just maybe have a, the odd cycle or two delay to arbitrate the memory bus between the processor and the DMA controller. So um, basically what I'm doing here is setting up a timer uh, a timer to generate these DM DMA transfers and I'm transferring it to the port B parallel port so I'm literally every, um, in the case of 500 kilohertz um, SPI rate, I've set up a counter to roll over every two microseconds and that generates a DMA request which transfers data from RAM to the parallel um, just standard I.O. port to output the, um, the data. And of course, I need the software needs to juggle all the bits around so that um, that memory is organised. So that, for example, one byte ho holds the first bit of each of the uh, outputs. Say, um, in this case, it's six outputs. Um, so I'm using six bits of that that output port. But obviously, the software needs to ju juggle all that around to format the stuff so it comes out in the right order. Um, interesting one thing I found on the, on the picket. I'm not sure how well documented it is. I, I haven't read it in detail, but um, port B is nominally a 16-bit port, but you can actually write that as two separate 8-bit ports. So if you just add one to the um, the latch address, it will actually just only write to the upper eight bits of it. So you don't have to dedicate the entire output port. So if your DMA task is writing to an output port, you can't really do anything else with that output port. Also, you can use any unused pins as inputs. You can map them to um, remappable peripherals but you can't easily use those as outputs also you could embed the output data in your output you know in the data you're sending but that gets a bit messy but the fact that you can actually write to a single byte means that in this case i'm only effectively wasting two pins and i can still use those as input so uh, that, that's not too bad what's happening if we just should do um this is the time of our value and this is time so what's happening is our timer is going up to a certain value this is specified by the PR register on the pick. So for example, if you're using timer three, that PR three would specify that value. So this is our timer incrementing. Each time it resets, that triggers the DMA operation. So that then outputs a new value on our SPI, or, uh, yeah, SPI value onto our parallel port pin. So you have six bits of that parallel output port become our six data outlines on our SPI port. So that's one. So on each, say in this case, we're doing six. Obviously, this this is obviously scalable to any number of ports, really. Um, so that's I'll just draw three. So this is our first byte of data in our buffer, which has got bits. So SPI is generally MSB first, so that'll be bit seven of each. Yeah, it puts a bit seven on each port, then bit six on each port. So that that takes care of the data, which is um, all very good. But of course, with SPI, we also need a clock, and obviously that clock has to be synchronous with this. Now, one option, specifically in the case of the pit, you could use the parallel master port mode, so that every time it wrote, it generated a a write enable pulse. Um, and in some situations that, that might be fine, and you could use that as the SPI clock, but the problem is that that pulse is generally going to be quite short, and I wanted to try and get a nice sort of reasonably even duty cycle just to minimise the um, any timing issues. So the way I generated the clock was, using the same timer that is driving this um, DMA task, I've set up a compare peripheral, effectively like a PWM. I, I've set this compare out to go high here and then low here. So... That gives us our SPI clock, which will go like that. To sort of clock each, clock each um, bit of data. Now that's fine, so we can generate a continuous stream of clocks and a continuous stream of data. 
but there is a bit of a problem with this in that you need to output this fixed number of bits and then stop so the chip then latches it and there's a slight problem as well how do you actually stop this because you need to make sure that you don't generate any excess clock well, this timer is just sort of free running now there might be some micros where you can tell a timer to count a certain number of times and then just stop but um, the bit you can't do that so there's a few ways you can do this one way is you can actually dedicate one of your outputs so let's say for example again we've got um, uh, however many SPI out outputs we can actually have another output whose sole function is to provide a clock enable so that when we're generating our shuffle data we set a bit high for the valid part of that data and then set it low and we do an extra dummy transfer at the end and then we externally gate that with our clock so it doesn't generate too many clock pulses which I mean that that would work that was the sort of first approach I was thinking about but that, yeah that needs external logic and we you know we want to try and keep this thing as, as simple as possible so then I started thinking well you know th the next obvious thing well you know this DMA transfer gives us an interrupt when the DMA has reached its program number of bytes now in this case we've got the serial data coming in under interrupt so we've potentially got quite a high light latency so we can't really use this interrupt as a traditional interrupt to stop this process because we might be in the middle of a serial transfer and again we might end up with a few spare clocks you know we're spending maybe sort of four or five microseconds in that serial interrupt so we may well get a few spurious clocks but if you remember what I said before when a DMA transfer completes, that can generate an interrupt, and any interrupt can then initiate a DMA operation. So, what this actually does, the timer is controlled by a, a control register, and one of the bits in that is just a bit that says whether the timer is running or not. So what we want to do basically is when this DMA is complete, we want to clear this bit so the timer stops. So all this process will just stop dead as soon as that DMA transfer is completed. So how do we do that? Well, we use DMA again. Um, fortunately, the pick and again in most, most DMA systems have more than one DMA channel. So what we do is we set a second DMA task up, which is triggered by the DMA complete task of the, of the channel that's doing all this stuff. And all that's doing is it transfers a single byte containing a zero in that position into our timer three control register. So all it's doing is really effectively just clearing that bit, but it's doing it without the need for any software intervention because it's done, done by DMA. Try, just try transferring that single byte to the control register means that we can get an accurately stopped signal, which yeah actually works really nicely. And yeah, there's no jitter, there's no external clocks. It just, just stops it dead. So that's a slightly uh, unusual way of using DMA and effectively you're using it to transfer a constant into a, um, a control register but uh, it, it does the job quite nicely. Right, so if we actually take a look at what's happening here, um, I've actually speeded up the serial, uh, the uh, serial input to run at six megaboard just to make things a little bit more extreme, extreme, but also show that there is actually plenty of margin. Yeah, this will actually work at six megaboard, um, although probably only run it at four because that's really all we need to uh, get the bandwidth we need. So we've got the serial data coming in here. Incidentally, one thing I quite like about this um, new Agilent scope is that it will do two simultaneous serial decodes. So for example, here we're decoding the incoming serial data, but we're also at the same time decoding the SPI output data. And also something that's really handy is it tells you exactly how many clocks it's seeing, so that when you're debugging this sort of stuff, it's really nice way of um, checking that everything's okay. You can also do things like two separate serial decodes at two different board rates as, as well, which is quite handy. So this is our incoming serial data. So that's our data. You can actually see some of the sort of the, the, the light patterns in there. Again, the blue is how much, when it's high, that's where we're inside it, when we're inside our serial receive routine. And the green is showing basically idle foreground time. When it's going up and down, that's our foreground task. So you can see at six megaboard where we've only got something around about a third of our total um, foreground processing time and we're, we're taking some fairly big chunks out of it and this gap here this is the time it takes to do all that bit shuffling to take that serial data and just rearrange the bits in the right order um, to then spit out the, the SPI ports uh, most of that's doing been done using sort of some fairly big unrolled loops just just for speed we don't really care about memory usage because this yeah there's very little code in this thing's only about 2k of code doing all this and about maybe a Two thirds of that is just this massive unrolled loop that's just taking, doing all this bit, bit shuffling, and this is our serial data 
um, coming out. It's a bit jittery because the basically um, the time that we're losing from this interrupt processing setting is a little bit variable, so, so we've got a little, little bit of jitter here. So we're sort of receiving the, the input, incoming data, sending the, um, the SPI data out. Now, this isn't the whole picture in terms of um, processing, in that generally what you would have is on one RS-485 bus, you'd have multiple ones of these with an ID. So you'd send out data perhaps, say, for four of these devices on a single 485 bus. So you need to be slightly concerned about how much effect the, the data that we're not looking at. So if I just add data for another, four, another three, um, three of these... So this first packet is the data that we're looking at, and this is just the other stuff that's floating around the bus being picked up by other other units in the system. Um, but you can see that's not really affecting the timing of our um, SPI output to any serious degree. It is affecting the time, the processing time. So if I just switch that back to one, just expand this a little bit. So so this is our time for doing the bit shuffling. So if I add more. more serial data you can see that ex that time extends because we're going into the interrupt routine but we're not actually taking that data in we're just saying okay this this is this um data isn't for us but we, we, we still have the interrupt overhead to actually deal with it so this time is extending but once we're actually getting into starting our dma process if i just increase the amount of data it makes it a bit more obvious and less jittery so now we're sending the full amount of data so this corresponds to about about um just under 300 leds and it's it's 16 bit per pixel as well, so it's a fair amount of uh, data. There's about 5,000 uh, SPI clocks there. But you can see as I add more data packets on the serial bus, this time isn't really changing because this is now happening by DMA. Before we we're still losing this foreground processing time, but because we're using DMA to send it out, it's not slowing our DMA process down at all because it's purely, you know, it's not using the processor at all. In fact, all the processor is doing in this in this portion is when it's not looking at the serial interrupt, it's just sitting there basically just waiting for the DMA to finish. It's not doing anything else at all. So uh, the, one of the reasons this is a little bit twitchy is that I'm generating all this data from Windows and the actual, you know, the packet-to-packet -packet timings all over the place purely because Windows has got some uh, all sorts of... Uh, delays uh, happening there and in fact uh, I, I've, I've sort of basically just sped this up just to see how far it will go before it falls over and it will quite happily go out at uh, send data out at one megahertz and um, once we get up to two megahertz it does start to fall over because one thing you'll notice it's now set it's now sending 225 clocks instead of 224 so i think what's happening is it's taking too long for that dma complete interrupt to stop that timer so we're getting a, a spurious clock pulse and um, things sort of start getting a bit jittery and again you're getting down to more to more the time scale for uh, memory bus accesses so you're going to start getting more jitter but um yeah it will quite happily spit data out, out at um, one megahertz so of course on this technique is probably also applicable for you know quite a few other things where you need to generate fairly precise timings over a number of buses when you don't have enough um onboard peripherals to uh, to do it so i'm uh, sort of quite pleased that that worked out quite nicely so yeah the whole solution is basically one chip no external gating instantly one quite nice thing about those tech these texas um 5971s they've got an onboard 3.3 volt regulator so it, the, its input logic is 3.3 volt whereas a lot of lead drivers you typically may you know, be running the leads at 5 volts and the drivers at 5 volts which means that the input thresholds are marginal if you're driving them from the 3.3 volt signal um, which means you tend to want to sort of stick some HCT buffers on the output to um, make sure that they sort of swing enough. But because these run at 3.3 volts, you know, you don't actually need that. So this, um, the design of this splitter is basically, it's just the PIC, a 485 receiver um, and a 3.3 volt regulator. And that's it. There's no, nothing else to it. Obviously, there's some damping resistors on the output just to avoid um, sort of nasty sort of ringing or anything on the SPI uh, clock and data outputs. But uh, so it's quite a nice sort of simple solution sort of fairly low cost and simple from the point you get it's easy to debug there's, there's very little code there to go wrong um, and yeah, the fact it will run at one megahertz it will run at six mega board um yeah suggest that we're not sort of really pushing things too far we're you know we've got plenty of margin running at um four mega board and um 500k uh, spi clock